Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, which is C++20, All the Small Things. I'm Fergus Cooper. Uh, if you weren't expecting all the small things, you might be in the wrong room, but hopefully not. It'd be great uh, if you're all here to, uh, to listen to me talk. So without further ado, I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. Um, you won't have seen me give a talk at a C++ conference before. This is the first C++ conference that I am talking at. It's actually my second time at C++ on C. I was there for the, the first iteration of it last year as a volunteer. And uh, this year, I am very grateful for Phil and the rest of the, the people who were vetting the, uh, the applications to give a talk that uh, they've let me give a talk this, this year. So uh, great. Um, I am a research software engineer at the University of Oxford. A research software engineer is a relatively new role within uh, academia, and it's been set up over the course of the last sort of four or five or six years. And research software engineers are academic positions. I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher, but we specialize in the kind of technical aspects of research. And what we do is we work with researchers around the university on a, a wide variety of different uh, research projects, um, but with a, an emphasis on software engineering. Um, and also training in software engineering best practices and principles. Um, I myself have been using C++ extensively since 2014. So 2014 is when I, I started my uh, doctoral project, which involved using a, a large set of C++ libraries. So I got into C++ with something called CHAST, which is the Cancer Heart and Soft Tissue Environment. It's a set of C++ libraries um, that do a whole uh, different variety of, of, of actually quite related things. Cardiac electrophysiology, so that's looking at um, you know, voltage traces of, 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 of tie over time in the heart, solving some complex uh, differential equations. Agent-based simulations of individual cells, so that was the part of Chase that I primarily worked on during my uh, doctoral work, and also lung physiology. And now these are all three kind of completely unrelated areas, but all of them require common libraries, common sets of things like the understanding of, of meshes and nodes representing points in space and solving differential equations. All of these things are common. So those sit in a set of libraries that then the cardiac and the cell-based and the lung build upon. Now, the reason that I kind of got interested in, in C++ is really that Chase itself, it was a little bit ahead of its time in terms of software development, software engineering in an academic context. Um, Chase started in, in 2005, which was actually a little bit before Git, for instance. So this was quite, quite a long time ago. And as far as um, mainstream academic projects go, Chase was one of the early adopters of what were being adopted as, as best practices, perhaps in, in other sectors, things like test-driven development, and continuous integration. And that's something that is really starting to pick up now. We, we see more the need for applying these kind of software best practices to these sorts of academic projects. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that just to give you the context of where I'm coming from and my interest in C++. But as far as my interest in C++ is concerned, I started uh, on this project. Uh, my supervisor at the time said, okay, first thing is you're going to need to write a class to do whatever it was I needed to do first. And so at that point, I had to learn what a class was. I had to learn C++. Um, and then I kind of fell down the rabbit hole. I got more and more interested. I found uh, CPP uh, Cast, the uh, the podcast that uh, I've, I've listened to religiously every, every week since then. Um, and then I started going when I could uh, make the time to Phil's uh, meetup in London and then as, as a volunteer to, um, to C++ on C last year, as I said. Uh, and I've got more and more involved, keeping up with uh, the latest evolutions in, in the language. And really where I'm coming from is uh, what do these advancements in C++ mean for the average person at you know, a university in a research institute who's using C++ as a tool to get a job done why those advancements are, are useful. And, and really this talk is gonna be about some of my favorite small features that are coming up in C++ 20. 
uh, the observant among you will notice that this is only a one hour talk. It's not a you know three day talk. So it's not uh, all the small things. It's uh, a very small subset of what I think are some of my favorite uh, components uh, and new features that are coming in C++ 20. But just a little bit of context to start off with. Uh, C++ is popular in academia. Obviously, we all know about some of the really big projects, big research labs that have a, a long history of, of using C++ for specific projects. But just in terms of you know, all sorts of um, everyday uses, particularly in things like the physics departments and engineering departments, maths departments, large numbers of people use C++, but they don't necessarily have um, the inclination to get as far into it as, as maybe a lot of us who are attending C++ conferences. In 2018, we launched a survey at the University of Oxford, and we found that C++ was the, the second most common programming language in terms of what people were looking for help with. The first was Python, overwhelmingly one, actually. Python is, is very, very popular in the kind of work I do. Second was C++, and third was MATLAB. C++ and MATLAB were, were relatively close in, in second and third place. And then um, R and C were uh, rounding off the top five. And so C++ really is quite popular. Now, it's worth no noting that the survey was skewed slightly towards mathematical and physical sciences. And so that might skew the picture in favor of things like C++ and not in favor of things like R. So the overall picture might be slightly different. But nonetheless, there are uh, hundreds of individuals and groups in the University of Oxford who use C++ on a regular basis for their research. However, training in software engineering is really not very common in academia. So I'm just going to take you through a couple of um, graphs that actually we produced as part of that survey that we did in 2018. So of the people we surveyed who identified themselves as being software developers, we asked them how they obtained that the, skill, the skills that they need uh, for, for their work. And the overwhelming majority, more than 70%, a little more than 70%, were self-taught. Only just over 20% had formal training in software development, and then a, a tiny fraction had any formal training in, in software engineering. What's the upshot of this, or what, what sort of other things can we collect? So we asked students and, and, and postdoctoral researchers, these are the people who are actually writing the code on a day-to-day -day basis on whatever projects they're working on. We asked students and postdocs who had said that they were regularly developing software, whether they were confident with version control. And you know, maybe the good news is that uh, nearly 40% of people said that they were confident and, and used version control frequently, but other um, you know, there, there's a substantial minority of people who are either not confident or have not heard of or never use version control. And these are people who are regularly writing software. And then the story gets worse, the more technical the things that you're asking them about. So confident with unit testing, 30% uh, never heard of, never use. Uh, more than that are not confident. And so well under half of the people who are regularly developing software in the University of Oxford are not confident in unit testing, quite possibly one of the most basic tools we have for verifying the integrity of a piece of, of software that we're writing. So this brings me to a slightly more relevant um, aspect, which is a, a, a piece of software that was used to uh, the, the underlay the report that came out of Imperial College by Professor Neil Ferguson uh, a few months ago. This was back in March. And this was the report that, at least for the UK, had these really stark warnings about, um, about coronavirus and really instituted the UK's uh, national lockdown. And it wasn't just the UK. The, the report also was about the United States. And this was a piece of science done by a leading epidemiologist, Professor Neil Ferguson, based on computational modeling using a piece of software. And this report was relied on heavily by SAGE, the, the, the group that advises the government on scientific matters. And so we would certainly hope that the software underlying this was really up to the best possible standards, well-written, well-tested, continuous integration, 
bells and whistles, we would hope, to really make sure that the results coming out of the software were things that we could uh, rely upon. Unfortunately, this wasn't really the case. So Neil Ferguson actually tweeted uh, back on the 22nd of March, I'm conscious that lots of people would like to see and run the pandemic simulation code we are using to model control measures against COVID-19. To explain the background, I wrote the code, thousands of lines of undocumented C, 13 plus years ago to model flu pandemics. Now, I just wanna make it absolutely clear at this point that I am absolutely not in any way blaming Neil Ferguson for the quality of the software that he was using. I'm not laying blame at anyone's door. I'm simply making some observations about the state of the art in current academic circles for people using C and C++ in their jobs. Now, since this tweet, the code that was used has been made open source. And actually, I believe Microsoft engineers spent some time converting it. It's now a C++ project. It's available open source on GitHub. You can go and look at it. If you're feeling really brave, you can look at the issues. And if you sort by most commented, uh, you'll find some actually pretty vitriolic comments, uh, which I don't think really have any place uh, on, on, on the internet. The problem in this case is that Neil Ferguson is a, an epidemiologist. He's a scientist. He's not had any, I would imagine, judging by the code, any formal training in software engineering best practices. And so it may not come as a surprise to someone who sort of, you know, is on the inside of academia looking at the kind of code that's being written. It didn't come as a particular surprise to me that there were, for instance, no unit tests whatsoever on this piece of code, this piece of code that was relied upon by the government to determine substantial policy in the UK. So not 100% ideal. But again, also not necessarily Neil Ferguson's fault, because that's just an aspect of academia that it's assumed that these people can do. And that's really part of actually research software engineering is making sure that that expertise is in place to make sure that the quality of software that's being produced is higher and is doing what we think it's doing. Okay, so uh, just to conclude this, this bit on context before I actually get into some C++, which I'm sure you're all here to, to listen about, uh, lots, lots of people use C++ in academia, lots of people in engineering departments, physics departments, maths departments, and wider use it on a regular basis. Very few people who are using C++ in my experience are experts. For the majority of people, it's just a tool to get the job done. It's something that's, you know, they, they need to be good enough to write the code to get the results for their next paper, and that's it, job done. And so I've been very heartened to see the recent changes in C++. They've been, they've been fantastic. Um, they make it easier to do the right thing, importantly, harder to do the wrong thing. We want to hide those parts of C++ that can get people in, in, into trouble, and it's safer by default. And so you know, it's things like type safety, things like not allocating memory and adding features to the standard library that make it more routine to do things the right way, remove those gotchas, remove those idioms that people have to learn and instead replace them by things that are more natural, easier to find and safe. So this talk, there'll be other talks at this conference and other conferences about the headline features. Uh, I didn't really want to talk about any of the headline features um, of C++20. I wanted to talk about a few of the little things that maybe you've not heard of, maybe you've not seen in action yet, but things that um, I, I really like, things that we're getting in C++20. And more importantly, what I want to convey is sort of why they're useful. And that's from my perspective as someone who's in academia, who sees people using C++, but who aren't experts in C++ and why I think some of the things we're getting in C++20 are really good from, from that point of view. So what we're going to cover um, is some new utilities that illustrate the kind of the, the, the really great progress that I think C++ is making. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, midpoint and LERP. LERP is linear interpolation. Better container semantics. Containers are obviously used all the time and there have been inconsistencies and oddities about the containers library. And, and so uh, better container semantics that we get in C++20 are really going to help improve 
that area with, with a few caveats that I'll talk about. And then a couple of new headers. These are some of the new headers that I really like. Uh, so source location and numbers. And so I'm going to start by talking about uh, midpoint and linear interpolation. So these are two things that uh, we're getting in C++20. They are two mathematically related functions. Uh, they're actually in different headers. We have um, stood midpoint, and that's in the numeric header. And what I've written here, this is mathematically what the midpoint is. And we'll all recognize this. We're just going to you know, add the two numbers together and divide by two. That gives us the midpoint, mathematically speaking. And linear interpolation. This is in a different header. This is in the CMath header. And linear interpolation say, is, is uh, given by this formula here, a plus t lots of b minus a. So we start at a, and we go some proportion of the way towards b. And if that proportion is between 0 and 1, then we are interpolating. And if it's outside of the range 0 to 1, we're extrapolating. So midpoint, given that it's just a plus b over 2, surely it doesn't need to be in the standard library, right? I mean, it's you know no one's going to waste any time. They'll just be able to write down the correct thing, a plus b over 2. And then suddenly, you look at this uh, little uh, toy example. Obviously, you know experienced C++ uh, coders will know exactly what's going to happen here. We do a plus b over 2, and we get something that's completely ridiculous. Obviously, the reason here is that a plus b might be too large to be represented as an integer. And so just writing a plus b over 2 won't work. OK, it might work most of the time, but you could easily run into these cases. They're going to be difficult to debug. People who don't have a degree in computer science might not even understand that this could be a problem. Um, and so a plus b over 2, not the right solution. As a mathematician, my background is, is maths. My undergraduate degree was mathematics. I know that a plus b over 2 is mathematically identical to a over 2 plus b over 2. So great, let's do that. Um, obviously, here we can already immediately see the problem. Uh, 25 over 2, as far as integers are concerned, is 12. 35 over 2 is, is, is 17. And so the midpoint here is 29, not 30, which is obviously the correct answer. And so you know, a and b, if they're integers, they might both round down. So we're going to be losing the precision that we need. a over 2 plus b over 2, well, that won't do either. OK, well, here's another thing. This is just like linear interpolation, right? Midpoint and linear interpolation are basically, you know, midpoint is essentially a specialization of linear interpolation, at least from a mathematical point of view. So how about using that linear interpolation formula just with t having the value of a half? a plus b minus a over 2. Where does this get us? Well, again, unfortunately, this isn't going to work either. In this example, the midpoint, we're going to run into exactly the same problem that we that we had the first time around. This b minus a term here is going to give us what, 2 billion plus a billion, 3 billion. That's too big. We're going to get overflow again. So the question then is, well, OK, we can't do any of the three things that, as a mathematician, we might immediately write down that would give us what we think is an appropriate way of calculating the midpoint of two integers. So the question is, well, how can we do it? So what I've presented here is an implementation of a more useful midpoint or a more correct midpoint that's based on the implementation in lib std, std C++ 9. And what I've done is I've, I've taken the implementation. I've uh, got rid of all of the nasty underscores. I've got rid of the templates and all of the other things. I've, I've tried to represent it in a way that will uh, not work generally. This is just for integers. But hopefully will uh, be as, as easy as possible to sort of see roughly what's going on. So there's a number of things going on here. And I'm not going to talk through everything that's happening. I don't even necessarily really understand it. I've gone through the pencil and paper, and it kind of makes sense. But what I really want to emphasize is that for a correct implementation of midpoint, there is a huge amount going on that you simply cannot expect a, 
an average user of the language to really grapple with or even really know about. And so here, what we've got in this particular implementation, at least, is we've got A, which is a signed integer, being assigned to an unsigned integer called low, and B being assigned to high. Now, this, I believe, is, is only really particularly valid as of C++20. It's well defined to assign a signed integer to an unsigned integer, and it will just wrap around into the other half. We, you know, sign, an, uh, an unsigned integer and a signed integer represent the same number of slots that you can represent a number as, but in different ways. And so now it's well defined for, for this to be to be happening. But bear in mind that you know if A is negative, then low is going to be a really high number. Now, if A and B are the other way around, then we flip these things, the direction is, is now opposite, and we have B is low and, and A is high. And then we return this. Now, again, we're taking high minus low, but remember, because of the wraparound, high minus low um, could also be negative, or at least would be negative if they were uh, both signed integers. We're taking an unsigned version of that, dividing it by two, and then taking the signed version of that and, and, and doing a calculation. So the point is, you know, I'm, I'm deliberately trying to present this in a slightly obfuscated way. The point I'm trying to drive home is that this, presumably, this is the implementation in libstud C++. This is presumably the best way that a bunch of really smart people could think to write a midpoint that works for integer types. And this is not something that we would expect an average C++ developer to be able to do or want to do. And for midpoint, which is a pretty common thing to want to do. I've wanted midpoint on a number of occasions, and I'll hold my hands up and say, I think every other time I've written midpoint, I've written A plus B over two, and I've just been hoping that I never have an integer big enough to have to worry about whether the result is going to be correct. And of course, added complication, it's different if it's uh, floating point types that you're wanting the midpoint of. So here is, again, Libstud C++ uh, implementation of midpoint for floating point types. Again, tidied up, underscores gone, templates gone, so it just works for floats. And we first of all take the minimum float that can be represented, multiply that by two. We take the maximum, divide that by two. And then we take the absolute values of the two arguments A and B, and we do some checks. So first of all, we see that if both of these numbers in absolute value are less than this upper limit and greater than this lower limit, then we're just going to return a plus b over 2. If one of those numbers is less than the lower limit, then depending on whether that's a or b, we're actually going to ignore dividing a by 2 or ignore dividing b by 2 and just divide the one that's bigger by two, add them together. And if either of these are not the case, so if the numbers are particularly big, so it's the, let's say that uh, you know A and B are both bigger than, or A or B are both bigger than this max over two, then we divide them separately and add them together and we have to do those two uh, divisions separately. Again, not that someone could not come up with this, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that this is, this is a difficult thing to get right. We shouldn't expect people to be able to get it right. And when finding the midpoint of two numbers is such a common thing to want to do, it's really great that it's in the standard library because we don't just don't have to worry. In fact, people using C++ don't even have to know that there's all of this subtlety hiding behind this midpoint function. So it get used, gets used everywhere. It's often as a building block, right? And this is, I think, marks out something, uh, you know, a, a test essentially for something being in the standard library. Is it often used potentially as a building block in more interesting, more complicated things that someone who's using C++ will want to write? So for instance, I mean, just as a, a trivial example here, calculating the median. Um, one of the talks I remember listening to uh, as a someone who's really getting involved in um, C++ trying to keep up with, uh, with with best practices was a great talk by Sean Parent. Um, 
unfortunately, I couldn't figure out any way to shoehorn a standard rotate into using a midpoint. Uh, so I did my second uh, favorite um, STL algorithm, which is nth element. So for calculating the median here, we can we want to go halfway through the vector. In this case, it's a vector of floats. So we ask for the nth element. Uh, we go halfway up, and then we have to check. And when we're calculating the median, if the length is odd, then we can just give the, the point that's at halfway. If the length is even, then we have to take the average of the one either side of the halfway point. And so here, this is just a, a classic place where we want the midpoint of two numbers, but we certainly at this point don't want to have to include all of that complexity in what is otherwise a relatively straightforward function to write ourselves. And so here, we're just then returning the midpoint of those two numbers either side of the halfway in the vector. OK, so now on to something that's related, linear interpolation. So again, linear interpolation now really only makes sense for floating point type. So that's that's good. It at least eliminates some of the complexity of having to work out how to do it for, um, for integers. But for floating point A, B, and T, we're going to return A plus and then some proportion of the distance from A to B. So again, this is interpolation if, if T is in 0, 1, and otherwise it's extrapolation. There are certain desirable properties of a function that does linear interpolation. So certainly, if we go none of the way from A to B, we should get back A. If we go all of the way from A to B, we should get back B. It should be monotonic in T. Now, monotonic means that if we look at this uh, original expression for the uh, for the linear interpolation, monotonic would simply mean that let's say that for the sake of simplicity, all of these numbers are positive. A and B are both positive, and B is greater than A. So we're starting at a number, and we're just going to go towards B in a nice positive direction. Monotonicity would mean that for any two values of t, if one's larger than the other, then the function is is the function values will be one larger than the other as well. It's absolutely clear that monotonicity holds in a mathematical sense. The, from this definition of what we mean by linear interpolation, monotonicity is obvious. Monotonicity is not obvious from the kind of computer science sense when you get into the complexities of how these floating point uh, operations work. So again, there's this dichotomy between the mathematics that someone who's a you know, maths grad or a physics grad or an engineering grad will understand and the kind of floating point mechanics that maybe someone who doesn't have a, a computer science degree will really understand the, the minutiae of. Finally, if A and B are finite and T is in zero one, then this uh, linear interpolation is finite. That's quite clear, right? If we're between A and B, anywhere between A and B should be representable. Okay. The problem again, and I'll go through this a little bit quicker because it's basically the same problems as, as with midpoint, uh, the obvious implementations aren't quite right. If we just take a plus t lots of b minus a, well, b minus a, that could overflow depending on the values of b and a. And as well, you know, mathematically speaking, if we put t is equal to 1, we will get back b. But that's not guaranteed to happen when we're dealing with floating point numbers. If we take another potential implementation, so this is, is like the, uh, the a over 2 plus b over 2 in the midpoint case, but now it's slightly different, 1 minus t lots of a and t lots of b. This is, I have it on good authority, not guaranteed to be uh, monotonic unless the product of A and B is less than or equal to zero. Now, again, this, this makes it abundantly clear that uh, I am a maths grad, not a computer science grad. I don't understand this. I don't know enough about how these floating point operations work to fully understand this argument, but I I'm gonna take it on, on, on very good authority that it is not the case that this implementation is monotonic even though it's mathematically equivalent to something that's clearly mathematically monotonic. Again, complexities. So again, let's look at the libstud C++ implementation of linear interpolation. We have a, an if statement at the start. So if A is, well, if A and B are either side of zero, that is if the product of A and B is less than or equal to zero, then we can go ahead and do um, this, uh, 1 minus t lots of a plus t lots of b. That's fine. It's monotonic in that case. 
Otherwise, then we get a, a, an edge case out of the way. If t is exactly one, return b, fine. Otherwise, we do something a little bit weird. Right? We calculate this um, candidate answer, a plus t, lots of b minus a. So that was back to the first definition that we tried to use. And then we do something that's that's a bit weird, right? This is not something that I'd want to have to write myself. This is going to take a lot of thinking about to convince myself that this is doing the right thing. I certainly wouldn't arrive at this overnight. If t is greater than one is the same true or falsity as b greater than a, then we return the max of b and x, otherwise the min of b and x. Okay, I mean, this is not super straightforward. And this is the point. Linear interpolation is a straightforward building block for a lot of other algorithms. It's commonly used, and a correct implementation turns out to be far from straightforward. So another great example of why it's a very good thing that this is in the standard library. This is used all over the place, computer graphics, uh, color maps. I've actually written a linear interpolation myself, not as sophisticated as these. Again, I'll hold my hand up and say, I just did the, the basic thing. Um, I was even least basing some points around a polygon. I mean, this comes up wherever you know, you're doing anything geometric, uh, this could crop up. But it's also the building block for lots of other algorithms. And so one of those algorithms is bilinear interpolation, which is used in sort of images. And so for instance, now that we have this in the standard library as a building block, we can very quickly do a bilinear interpolation. It's a very small thing. It just takes three linear interpolations. So we have here a function that takes a position x and y in some, you know, imagine it in the unit square, and it's some position in that unit square. And we have values representing the, the heights of this map at the four corners of the unit square. We do one interpolation along the bottom x, one along the top x, and then another interpolation perpendicular to that to get the answer. And really just as an excuse to put a colorful picture of something in, in this uh, slideshow, this is uh, an example where I've just calculated the bilinear interpolation. I've got four values at the corners of this square. And again, you do one interpolation x um, along the bottom, one interpolation in x along the top, and then an interpolation in y down perpendicular to, to get the answer. And so there's you know, three linear interpolations for each of these individual squares that's a slightly different color. Fine. So some short remarks on this. This is two excellent examples of simple functions that's non-trivial to implement correctly. This is speculation on my part. A tiny proportion of, of C++ users actually have a computer science degree. And so we really, as far as possible, should be shielding the average user from having to understand all of these complexities in order to do simple things correctly. And common building blocks like midpoint and linear interpolation are, in my opinion, excellent additions to the standard library. We're not wasting time reinventing standard tools. There's no chance of accidentally getting it wrong, which easily could happen. And I myself have written several times things that are just accidentally wrong that, that could turn out to, to cause me problems if I just happen to pass in particularly large values or particularly small values. Um, and the question is, are these things common enough to justify inclusion in the standard library? And this really is an interesting question. I personally think it'd be great to have other interpolation algorithms, maybe cubic interpolation in the standard library. But then really there's a question of what proportion of people using C++ would need that feature. And I understand that there has to be some give and take between what is used enough and what's just nice to have. And so now I'm going to have a, a, a very short pause for questions. I understand that there's a 20 second delay or so on this stream. So I'm just going to pause here for a little bit, sip some water, and I'll just monitor the uh, Q&A just in case anything pops up. So please do ask a question if you'd like to. There'll be obviously more opportunity for questions at the end. So there's no questions at the moment. I'll just wait another few seconds just in case any come in um, right now. Otherwise, in a few seconds time, I'll just carry on.
Okay, I see no questions still. So in that case, I'll get on with the second part. And I'm going to talk about better container semantics. First of all, very short one, uh, but one that I think is very nice. We have a new member function contain or contains for associative containers. So this is a member function for the associate, associative containers map, multi-map, set, multi-set, and their unordered varieties. We want to check if an, we often want to check whether an element exists, uh, but this is very unintuitive for beginners, right? So if we have here a set of characters A, B, C, D, you know the idiom for this is if we do this s dot find is not equal to s dot end. So you know find will go through and it will give us back an iterator to the particular element um, that we have found or or not. And so if if nothing is found, we will just end up with the iterator to the uh, point at the end of the um, set in this case. This is unintuitive. This is something that you have to teach beginners. And if you just look at the things like Stack Overflow, you'll find that these kind of questions are asked on a regular basis, right? because it's not straightforward to determine how to check whether something exists in one of these associative containers. And so this is a very quick one, but from C20, uh, this is simplified. It's a, a small, it's a quality of life improvement, but now we can ask if a set contains C, and we'll just get back a true or a false. That's great. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a really small thing, but it's one more idiom that we don't have to teach people who are new to the language. Moreover, when someone types S dot in their IDE, they're going to get a list of functions. One of them will be contains. It's clear what it means, and it does what you expect it to do. The only slight quibble I'd have with this is whether this actually reduces some consistency with the other non-associative containers. For instance, if you say have a vector of integers and you want to know whether that vector contains a three, there is no vector contains a member function. And so you're back to a previous idiom of maybe doing a, a standard find algorithm and again, checking whether it's equal to the end of the vector. So great that we've got it for these associative containers, is it a missed opportunity that we don't have it for the other containers as well? Um, perhaps. I'll leave that as an open question. Next, we get on to consistent container erasure. So again, speaking of idioms that beginners find difficult uh, is erasing elements from containers, right? This, this comes up all the time. Uh, let's take the standard vector arrays. So arrays takes one or two iterators and it erases one if you have one iterator, or a range of elements from the vector. OK, fine. So you first have to find the elements that you're looking for. Well, there's an algorithm that we use for finding things. It's called a remove or remove if. So we first have to do a remove. That moves things to the end. Um, and then we erase them with arrays. Simple? Well, not really. And there are a few gotchas, right? This is what it looks like. We're doing. Here we've got a vector of characters, A, B, C, D, and E. And first of all, we remove with the begin and end of the vector and the thing we want to remove, in this case, C. And that will move the C to the end. But then we have to erase. So then we erase from the result of this remove, which is going to be pointing us to the start of the removed elements. And then we have to go to the end. And so, of course, there are a few problems with this. First of all, this is unintuitive. Nobody who's new to the language will immediately be able to write this down when they need to erase things from a vector. And the second problem is it would be very easy to forget this v dot end here. And then if you've removed multiple things, it's not going to work. It's not going to do what you expected it to do. So C20 adds free functions, erase and erase if, that do what you expect. So let's just quickly see those in action. So here I've got a predicate, uh, and all it's going to do is it's going to return true if any character is greater than C, whatever greater than C means. You kind of know what it means, so it's, it's OK for this example. So here we've got a set, A, B, C, D, and E. And first of all, I'm going to print out the size of that set. It's going to print 5, because there are 5 characters. I'm then going to do an erase if on that set with the predicate. And that's going to print out two. That's because erase if is going to tell you how many things were erased. And that's potentially useful because you might be interested to know whether something was erased at all. 
And so if this returns something greater than zero, you know something was erased. So that's quite nice. And then just to check, the size of this set afterwards is indeed three. We've actually removed the D and the E. They're actually gone. We don't have to do anything else. We've just done one function called erase if with the container and the predicate, and it's just worked. Fantastic. This is just so much cleaner than it was before. And the nice thing is that this one is consistent, right? We have a vector containing the same things, A, B, C, D, and E. We erase if, the vector, the predicate, and it does the same thing. And it works for strings as well. Strings also have a, a, an overload for this erase if function. So with the same predicate and the same underlying data, a bunch of characters, A, B, C, D, and E, in a set, a vector, a string, one function erase if does the job. Great. Ish. Unfortunately, despite the proposal being called consistent container erasure, it's slightly lost on me that it is particularly uh, consistent. We've gained erase overloads for basic string, dq, vector, forward list, and list, and erase if overloads for all of those ones plus associative containers, map, multi-map, set, multi-set, and the unordered components. But what we don't have is a stud arrays for map, multi-map, set, multi-set, and their unordered components. Sorry, exactly the opposite of what I said. No. Is that what I meant? The point is that now there's a partition in how do we erase things from um, containers. So yes, I was right the first time. Again, this just proves my point. This is difficult to remember. We now have to remember whether we can use the new free function arrays or whether we have to use the existing member function arrays, which we would have to use on map, multi-map, set, multi-set, and their unordered counterparts. And this just seems a little bit annoying, if nothing else. Um, but you know, we'll have to we'll have to live with it. So on to the next thing, which is going to hopefully solve some problems, um, is signed size. Uh, containers, we've always been able to query a container for its size, uh, and that size that's returned is an unsized, uh, an unsized integer type, usually a stood size t or similar. And so we've got a vector of integers in this case. We can loop over this vector in, in, in the sort of standard way using a, a regular for loop, and we go up to v dot size, which is an unsigned. This isn't ideal because we're doing a comparison here between a, a signed integer i and an unsigned integer v dot size. That's not necessarily too bad. Um, the, there are other patterns, though, that are more dangerous. So this is an example that I've adapted from the proposal P1227 by Jörg Brown, which is checking uh, whether, in this case, a vector of ints, in my example, is something that has repeated values. And so here we're going to check, starting from 0, going up to 1 less than the container size, whether two consecutive items in the container are the same. Again, this seems like a reasonable thing to do, and this seems like exactly the kind of thing that someone who was perhaps new to the language or wasn't particularly um, familiar with, with needing to check for all of these edge cases might write. Um, and actually, it's worth saying that my ID didn't warn me about any potential problems with this, um, which I was potentially expecting it to do. But certainly, if we were to then pass in an empty vector in this case, we're going to be going from container.size, which is 0, minus 1, which, because this is unsigned, is a huge number, and we're going to get problems. OK, so great. In C++20, we got a signed size, um, stood size, that would solve these problems if used. Again, the potentially a slight problem is that we only got a free stood size function. We didn't get member functions to size that would uh, perhaps be a natural drop-in replacement that people could use. You know, When they see uh, v dot and their ID gives them a list of things, they're still going to see size. So I think probably, unfortunately, this isn't going to remedy as many of the you know, preventable problems that, that could have been remedied uh, because you know, people um, don't necessarily know their standard library inside out and aren't necessarily going to know that this uh, sign size function exists. And so people will probably still use size. Now, obviously, from a pedagogical point of view, we probably should be using range-based for loops or STL alg algorithms where possible. And certainly the specific example of whether something has repeated values 
um, can be done differently. We can use a adjacent find from the algorithms library and that will circumvent this problem. But when that's not possible, maybe you need to omit the, the start or the end, um, this sign size makes it easier to do the right thing, provided we know that sign size exists and we know when it's appropriate to do so. But is it a missed opportunity not having it as a member function? Well, most C++ programmers, again, aren't experts. They don't know the standard library inside out. And I think they're more likely to pick from the list of member functions that their IDE will provide for them. And so people probably are still going to see size and not sign size, and maybe won't even know that the size they're getting back isn't a signed type. And again, this comes down to consistency. Would it be better to have size and sign size both as member functions to be more consistent? Yeah, I tend to say probably, but again, I, I'm, I don't know what the considerations were that went into that decision. And maybe this can all be solved with better tooling. Maybe as tooling continues to improve, we will have IDs that will suggest to us that maybe we should be using std um, sign size if we're actually ending up in a situation where we have a comparison between a signed and an unsigned integer, maybe. Okay, and just to round out this um, section before moving on to the final section, we get a couple of really great new string utilities. Starts with and ends with. In my opinion, these are indispensable. Um, I use them all the time uh, with scientific code. There's a lot of places in scientific code where people are loading data in from files um, and just for checking whether something has a particular file extension is, okay, probably not the best way to do it, but it works and it's great. And so checking whether a string ends with another string is, again, something that's not beginner friendly. Here's one way that we can do it. Um, we have to, first of all, check the lengths. Then we use the compare member function. We have to know which order the things go and compare. I always find this slightly confusing. It's the, the, the distance of the comparison first, and then the thing that you're actually comparing against at the end. Um, and you're checking whether that's equal to 0. So again, you need to know how compare works. You need to remember to do this length check at the start, otherwise it won't catch all the edge cases. Um, but now in C++20, we have starts with and ends with, and then we can do code like this. Uh, so for instance, here using the uh, file system library, we can recursively traverse a particular directory, and then we can ask if any of those paths end with dot dat and put those back in a vector somewhere. So this is nice. It just takes out a lot of complexity that otherwise would exist lets you do natural things that you want to do all the time, like checking whether a string ends with another string. So it's intuitive, it's easy to find, and it's a common thing to want. So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it fulfills all the requirements to, to get it put into the standard library. It's something that everyone wants, and it's annoying to do correctly. OK, so a few remarks on this. We've got in C++20 loads of small improvements uh, to containers that make life well, safer for non-experts. There are fewer gotchas. It's easier for everyone. It's a little bit less frustrating trying to figure out how to do something. It removes several idioms that must be taught. I mean, by definition, an idiom is something that really has to be taught. You're not going to stumble across an idiom. You're going to have to really think about it, and that has to be taught, and that's not ideal. Well, it probably reduces stack overflows carbon footprint, and that's a nice thing. You know, there's going to be, hopefully, uh, a lot less people having to um, you know, go on to Stack Overflow to figure out how to do basic things, like check whether something's in a set or, or erase elements from a map or something like that. But the, the one slight note I'll, I'll end on on this section is some of these concepts seem to have just stopped slightly short of the consistency and simplicity that they might otherwise have had. Is there a good reason not to have erase for set? I'll be available to talk to afterwards. So if anyone can tell me a good reason not to have an arrays free function for a set, uh, I'd love to hear about that. Again, is there a good reason for not having sign size as a member function for, for these containers? I don't know. There might be. But again, uh, questions for the philosophers. And right now, I'm going to have a short pause. I see that there are a few questions. So I'm just going to have a sip of water. Then I'll get going on the questions from, I think, the previous section uh, and then see if any more appear. Uh, so Kate Gregory wrote it first, uh, but I also wonder why was the name Lert chosen? Uh, that's that's a really uh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to make much sense. The, the the reason that linear interpolation was chosen, having read the paper, 
is because it is commonly in use. It's used all over the place, particularly in graphics and things. And LERP is a really standard phrase that people know, and it means the same thing to all of these people who've used it. Having said that, it is a very valid question. LERP doesn't really seem to naturally come from the words linear interpolation particularly well. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a horrible piece of jargon, really. Um, but it's chosen for consistency. Could we have done better? Yeah, probably. Uh, next question. Uh, do you think there should be more overlap between sci uh, scientific programs and CS programs at uni? Well, that's a really interesting question. And the answer is uh, maybe. I know that at Oxford, which is the only university that I've really seen the, an overview of, of what happens, I'm not sure if that would really solve the problems because particularly in Oxford, um, the CS programs are very theoretical. So even in the CS programs at Oxford, you're certainly not being taught C++. Uh, you're being taught what essentially amounts to um, pure maths uh, in a lot of cases and, and certainly is, is a very theoretical computer science curriculum. So probably there isn't um, much to be gained in Oxford from having that crossover. But certainly what people ought to be being taught, if they're interacting with code, people should be learning things like version control and, and how to do unit testing and all of these things. Um, and we know that there's a huge demand for it. In the research software engineering group, we do training and the training that we do often sells out in minutes. We did the first uh, course on um, version control. We limited it to 20 people because we didn't know how many people we could really talk, teach, teach all at once. And that sold out in something like 12 minutes of us putting it up on a, an Eventbrite page as, as a free event. And similarly, I've taught a course on uh, using the um, C++ uh, algorithms library sold out uh, in, in, in very short order. So there's a huge amount of demand in the university for learning about these topics and nowhere near enough supply in terms of people teaching these topics. Uh, so next question, is there also a contains free function like begin? Uh, no, I don't think there is, but I might be correct on that, but no, I don't think there is. Um, and someone's asked a question here, uh, LERP is only four characters long and dates to the days uh, when only the first six characters of a symbol were significant. Um, see Strulen. So not, not a question, but a comment. So there we go. That clears up that to a certain extent. Having said that, those limitations don't any longer exist. Could C++ have set a trend in a slightly better named method? Uh, probably. Okay, anyway, um, on with the final section now. So new headers. I'm going to talk about two. Source location first. This is just a great little thing. I mean, I, I just, I like this. Uh, it's it's not going to revolutionize anyone's life, but you know, I, I quite like it. So here's an example of how to use source location. We have um, as a second parameter with a default to this log function, we have a source location um, has a static method called current. And that lets us query that source location for the file name, the line, and the column. Great. So here, if we just log message, what we're going to get back is something like a path to main.cpp, line 12. A column always came out of zero, so I don't really know what the column is doing. It's not implemented yet, except in GCC stood experimental. Uh, so I don't know whether that's a complete implementation or, or what. But it doesn't exist yet, as far as I can tell, in any of the main libraries. So just a real world example of what this might look like. So this is from Chase, the software that I work on. Um, and uh, Okay, apart from a stray bracket that seems to have crept onto this. Here we had a, a there's a, a macro, this is kind of caveman debugging. You sprinkle this macro everywhere when 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 your program's crashing and see what the last mark to get printed out was. Well, this could be replaced by a function that does exactly the same thing. Now, okay, this one's slightly more colorful with the syntax highlighting, but you know, there are lots of things to be said about macros, um, but really the the thing that I dislike most about macros is it's like an extra dialect that you have to learn, right? It's not like learning C++. You have to learn a completely separate set of rules. Um, it's not nice. So replacing macros with standard C++ is just easier for people to learn. You only have to learn C++. You don't have to learn all of this additional stuff on top of it. So, you know, the fewer macros, the better, in, in my opinion. Unfortunately, we have other kind of macros that maybe get the name of a variable. So here, printing a variable, it's going to print out the name followed by the value. 
And we can't do that yet. So before we can get rid of all of these macros, we're going to have to wait for things like reflection. And uh, hopefully those will be coming uh, any day now. OK, finally, on to the uh, very last bit of this uh, talk, mathematical constants in a new numbers header. There's lots of maths in the standard library, right? We have functions, exp, log, pow, square root, etc. We have new ones like lerp. We also have functions like complete elliptic integrals of the second kind, uh, Bessel functions, um, spherical Neumann functions. I have a maths degree and I've never used these and I don't know what they're used for. I'm sure they're very useful for some people. But the point is there's lots of maths and it may come as a surprise perhaps to some people to, to not realize that mathematical constants like pi and e and till c plus plus 20 were not defined in the standard library. So we had all sorts of interesting math special functions, but no pi, no e, no log two. And the math.h headers typically define these macros. In Microsoft, you had to also define this use math defines beforehand uh, before you included cmath. And these are typically just macros defined like this. You just get a string of numbers. Um, so here we have uh, m underscore pi and m underscore e. If you wanted the long double version of that, you write m underscore pi lowercase l. Not the most intuitive thing, but sort of gets the job done. But the problem is it's never been standardized. And so these things just don't reliably exist on different platforms. But we don't really like macros, so we want to know how to replace those. Well, one thing we could do is just expose constants, right? We could just say pi e, put them in a the namespace, and um, that would be fine. The problem is this doesn't solve that problem of also getting float or long double versions of these constants. Well, C++14 introduced these variable templates, which let us define templated constants. So that looks a bit like this. So here we might have a long double representation, uh, the maximum precision that we need. And then we can cast that to other floating point types. And that would allow us to say, you know, pi angle brackets float double or long double. And actually in the C++ standard library in C++20, we actually got both of those things. We've got float double and long double via the namespace std numbers. And then we've got pi v, which can be um, a float double or long double. And then we also got double specializations for all of these numbers um, that we can just access again through the standard numbers um, namespace. And the reason it's in standard numbers is otherwise, if it was just in the standard namespace, that's going to create a lot of extra uh, pollution and uh, might cause some problems, particularly with common things like E. Anyway, so these are the constants that we got. A lot of ones that relate to, to E in some way, logs and uh, and things. We got some that relate to pi, some that relate to these, these radicals. And then we got a couple of additional constants via the golden ratio. And this is a, a, a different constant. And we are now guaranteed to be able to replicate everything that was previously defined in the math.h headers in full precision using the numbers that are now defined in the mathematical constants. So that's great. It's just a nice addition long overdue, perhaps, um, and something that people probably didn't realize wasn't in the standard. OK, and um, I'll just end on this. <laughs> Unlike the Indiana General Assembly, the C++ standard uh, did not attempt to legislate the value of any of these constants. This is actually something that happened. Uh, someone in uh, 1897 tried to essentially establish uh, the mathematical fact that pi is equal to 3.2. Uh, fortunately. <laughs> There was a professor in the audience who uh, set the record straight on that one, and instead, in the in the um, in the the, the C plus plus standard, we just get that uh, they must be the nearest representable values of all of these things. It would uh, be pretty awful to be the person who was responsible for writing the standard who made a typo, say, in the third place of pi, um, causing all sorts of problems for the rest of time. So, uh, no such problems in the library. Anyway, that's it. Those are the things that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, many thanks for listening. And I'm just going to take any questions that uh, pop up in the feed in the next few seconds. Um, why are pi f and l, et cetera, not const expra? Um, so I'm sure they probably are. I, you might be referring to the, the code that I put in, in which case I may have just neglected to make them const expra. I'm sure the ones in the actual standard library are. 
when I was talking about the variable templates, I just put some code together and probably just neglected to make them const expr. Uh, um, why do we need square root of two, et cetera, instead of having a const expr square, square root and writing square root of 2.0? Um, that's a good question. I suspect the answer is that you might not be guaranteed to get the full amount of precision if you're using a square root function. But again, uh, my background is maths, and obviously to me that would make sense. I, I suspect there, there must be a very good reason, so I suspect it must be that you can't necessarily get those last few digits of precision guaranteed if you're using a square root function, would be my, my hunch on that. I don't see any other questions popping up just at the moment. Okay, one has just popped up. And it says, hopefully we will ultimately get const expr square root. Uh, I've had a proposal in the works for more than four years, trying to get things like std abs, et cetera, const expr. Uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds great to me. Uh, more, the more const expr, the better. Um, yeah. More of a comment than a question. But otherwise, uh, apart from that, it doesn't look like there are any other questions. Um, so that's it. Thanks very, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Thanks for listening. Hopefully it was uh, moderately interesting for some of you. And um, I'll call it a day.